If they're shooting at you, they're... You gotta put your past behind you. When, when I started writing my book two years ago... That's just, what is the... What is the ha For the secret of cooking a great turkey is letting it rest. Beautiful Hawaii. All right, guys, I have got to... Excuse me, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you have time to talk about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Hey, don't run from the Lord. Your thoughts are incredibly powerful. And so this Sunday, I'm going to share some advice that no one actually... Welcome everyone to Prairie Heights. Hey, my name is Beth, if I haven't had the chance to meet you. And I got to tell you, if you have a pulse, if you have a heartbeat today, something's going to change you. Something's going to change you. And my prayer is that it's not just something, it's someone. And I pray that it's more than just the stories that we're going to hear after a few minutes here. It's more than just maybe a personal relationship that you have with someone that that's the reason you came. I hope that as we go through today that you feel something, that maybe you learn something, and that Jesus becomes the greatest influencer of your life. We're in week number three of a five-week series called Jesus the Influencer. This whole series is about shifting our influence from like celebrity influences and spending all our time finding out what they wear and you know, what makes them so cool, <laughs> and shifting our focus and following the greatest influencer of all time, the influencer that can actually change your life from the inside out. Someone who, when you give your life to him, he can give you life. And in turn, you can begin to live your life like him, and other people's lives can be changed because you make that very Decision. So what we've been doing in this series is we've been uncovering consistent character traits of Jesus so we can become more like him. And through his influence in our lives, I believe we can change the world around us. I believe it's so important that you and I answer the question, who are we following these days? And that we get really serious about following Jesus because it can change your world and it can change the world around us. It can change our community. And so today, this week, we're going to talk about the character trait of generosity. And I can't wait. This is one of my favorite. I love generosity. I love learning more about generosity. I love being generous. It's one of the ways that I feel like God has just uh, given me a gift in that. And I love it. So I'm going to get real passionate. You guys ready? Okay. <laughs> Did we have coffee available this morning? All right, now that I got you with me, when you and I think about generosity, here's some things that we think about. We think about like, you know, rounding up when we go to the restaurant and we say, yeah, we'll round up a dollar. When we think about generosity, we think about going through the Starbucks line and paying it forward paying for the person behind us, which, let me be honest, like, it's generous for the first person, but that's about it, because who wants to be the person in line who stops the generosity for the day, right? When you realize that your coffee is free, and then they kind of look at you, and you're like, I think I have to pay for the person behind me. <laughs> so the first person was generous in that. When we think about generosity, we think of the very famous time that Oprah said, you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. We think about these big moments of generosity. And here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that those things, yes, they can, they can be very generous. They can be. And with the right heart, absolutely, they are generous. But here's what Jesus did. Jesus took all that, like the world's idea, our idea of generosity, he put it in a cannon Get this, and then he blew it up like a bunch of fireworks. Because here's what Jesus did. Jesus gave his life. Talk about generosity. Here's what Jesus did. In John 3, 16 and 17, we learn this. For this is how God loved the world. God loved the world that he gave 
He gave generous gift. He gave, what did he give? He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus gave his life so we could have life. Generosity is who Jesus is. It is who he is. So talk about a character trait. If we want to learn to really be generous, we've got to learn more from Jesus. We've got to learn about how he teaches us to be generous. And so because generosity is a consistent character trait that he modeled, I'm going to share a story today, and it comes from the book of John. And we're going to see how he taught generosity to his followers through a miracle. And this is the only miracle in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's recorded. It's the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels, and I just imagine there's a reason for that. And so I think we got to pay attention. I think this is really important, this story that I'm about to tell. And uh, I think God's going to teach us, me and you, something brand new about generosity. So it comes from John chapter 6. Let me set the stage for us. So Jesus had uh, got done teaching to a group of people. And as he was teaching to a, a group of people and his influence was growing, like people were starting to follow him and they would travel wherever they needed to travel so they could follow him and they could hear from him. It's like he was trending. <laughs> you know, he was trending and, and people couldn't wait to follow him. And so as we read this story and as we dig in, we're going to uncover how Jesus teaches us to be generous. And as we dive into this story in the scripture, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be thinking about who are you in the story. There's a few different people in this story, and so I want you to be thinking about who do you most relate with in this story. We've got the crowd of people, the people who are coming to hear from Jesus. We've got Jesus. We've got one of Jesus' followers. His name is Philip. We've got another one of his followers, and his name is Andrew, and then we've got a young boy. And so as I go through this story, in this first part, I want you to think about who are you today in the story. John 6, 5 through 9, it says this, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, who's one of his followers, he said, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And I think Jesus, I don't think I know, he's super intentional. He was always really intentional. And we see in this moment how he wanted to expose a gap. I believe he wanted to expose a gap for Philip in Philip's understanding of generosity. And so he asked Philip, hey, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Because the crowd is so large. And like, you know, they couldn't, pick up the phone or grab their cell phone and door dash food to them. Say like, hey, we need some pizzas real quick from Casey's and why don't you grab some gummies and some uh, Sprite and Dr. Pepper and we got to feed all these people. They couldn't do that. And so they had to figure out a way to feed all these people. Verse 7, Philip answered him and he says, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Philip is like, he's starting to calculate the cost of this. He's looking at all the people and he's like, that would take half a year's wages. Are you kidding me? I don't have money for that. We, don't have, we can't pay for that. We can't make this work. Verse 8 says, another of his disciples, so another follower of Jesus, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and he said, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. And so Andrew does something real great and he, and he brings a resource into the picture. And he says, hey, there's a young boy that has, has some food and he can help. And then Andrew says, but, but how far will they go among so many? And so what we see here is that Philip first, he was super limited. In his thinking, he was calculating the cost and he was trying to figure out how are we going to make this work. And then we've got Andrew who says there's this young boy that is available, but how far is it going to go? 
And what we recognize in both of those followers of Jesus, they both were saying, we don't have enough. We don't have enough. We don't have enough to feed these people. We don't have enough to give. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever experienced that where you've said like, I don't have enough to give. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough leftover at the end of the month. I don't have enough energy or time or I don't have the right gifts. Where are you in the story today? Are you living a a limit? That there's a limit. But then we've got this young boy and what I want us to recognize is that we're never too young to make an eternal difference. We're never too young to feed a crowd of people. We're never too young to have our faith brought to the table to be shared with other people. We've got this young boy who Andrew says, hey, this young boy's got some loaves and some fish. And this young boy offers everything he has. This young boy doesn't hesitate. This young boy doesn't say, there's no way this will feed the crowd. This young boy says, take everything I have and he offers everything we have. The first way that Jesus teaches us to be generous is he says, offer what we have. Offer what you have. Stop making excuses. Stop giving leftovers. Stop saying you don't have enough and start offering what you have and bringing it to Jesus. And let's find out what Jesus did with that offer. Let's find out what he did. John 6, 10 through 13, it says, Jesus said, have the people sit down And there was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. See, uh, as they were writing and and scribing the Bible, in that culture, in that time, they counted only men because that was part of their culture. And realistically, it says 5,000 in the scripture because 5,000 were men, but they would have been traveling with women and children, and so they say the crowd was actually 10 to 15,000 people was this crowd of followers wanting to learn from the greatest influencer of all time is 10 to 15,000 people. And this young boy has five loaves. And how many fish? Two small fish. And Jesus took the loaves, he gave thanks, and he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all had enough to eat, did you see that? When they all had had enough, when they all had enough, because when it goes through Jesus' hands, we will always have enough. You will always have enough when Jesus is in the picture. He said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and they filled 12 baskets. They filled more baskets with the leftover than with what they started, with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. What do we learn in that Second way of how to be generous is we trust. We trust Jesus with what we give. This young boy offered everything he had and then he trusted Jesus with what he had because here's the truth about Jesus. Whatever passes through Jesus' hands will be multiplied. Jesus is not in the business of addition. He doesn't add things together. Jesus is in the business of multiplication. Jesus is a multiplier. He takes what we offer him, he takes what we give him, and he multiplies it. And so when you and I trust him with what we have and we give it to him first and we say, God, do with it what you would like, that is how we learn to be generous. I'm convicted about this. I believe that generosity is a choice I believe that generosity isn't something you do. I believe it's something that you can be. 
And I believe it's not even possible to be generous without Jesus. Not this type of generosity. Not the type of generosity that gets multiplied. And here's what I love about being part of this church family, is that at Prairie Heights, we are choosing to be generous. We are choosing to live it out in crazy, outrageous ways. One of our core values here is gen- give generously, and we're all growing in that together. We've all been challenged in that most recently. In this past spring, I shared our vision to stand for the people of our community, that we're going to choose to stand in the gap for the people of our community. I want to take us back to that moment last spring. Go ahead and take a look. We have a unique opportunity to come together as a church family to experience Jesus in a whole new way. What we get to experience is you get to witness a church coming together. You get to witness people coming together and believing in faith that God can do way more than any of us could do on our own. Together we are choosing to stand for changed lives, for future generations, transform community. Everyone is invited, and I believe today is one of those days that we're never going to forget. Doesn't that just fire you up? It sure fires me up. You know why we're doing stand? We're doing stand because there are people that you and I love in this local community in Cass and Clay County who are living apart from Jesus. And Jesus wants to be the leader of their life. And God has called our church to be a church that would step into that gap. There are people that you live with, that you work with, that you engage in community with, that God wants to be the leader of their life. There are people that you don't even like that need to know Jesus. And God has called our church to stand in that gap. And when you and I learn how to be generous... When we learn how to offer everything that we have and trust Jesus with the results, here's what the results are that Jesus gets all the credit for is all these lives that we get to celebrate today. God gets all the credit for what's happening and I'm gonna share some of their stories and it's gonna impact you today. And so when we choose to stand for transform community, we're gonna proactively close the gap in mental, financial, and emotional health And so I want to share a couple of the stories of the people getting dunked today. We've got Dan, and he shares that uh, he grew up in a traditional church background and shares that he didn't really practice. He said, my life before I said yes to Christ felt very empty and hollow. You're not alone in that, Dan. He says, I said yes to Christ about a year ago when I first found Prairie Heights Church. And the people at Prairie Heights were really instrumental in me saying yes. He says, I feel like my life has really changed for the better, and I think my relationship with my family has gotten better all around. I think I feel more at peace and less anxious overall, thanks to Prairie Heights. We give God all the credit for that story. Then we got Shannon, and she says, "Uh, when I was in high school, I felt alone. I had a ton of friends, but something was missing. Anybody else feel that? Sometimes you got a ton of friends, but you know something's missing. She says, my mom had asked me a million times if I wanted to go to church, and I always refused because I was stubborn. Thanks for being honest. (laughs) She says, I had heard about this church. Years had passed, and as an adult, she says, I heard about this church, Prairie Heights, and asked my husband if we could go, and we did, and I loved it. I felt God there along with the Holy Spirit. And then she says, I no longer felt alone, and I'd found what was missing in my life. I've been blessed beyond measure. Blessed beyond measure. And then we've got Michelle, and this is a crazy, funny story. And so part of our vision for Stand is to help people have financial health and to honor God in the way that they manage their money. And so we're offering more Financial Peace University classes as well as supporting our local community and high school students having access. And because of your giving, we get to do that. And so Michelle, get this, her and... Uh, Her and her husband show up on faith night last Sunday, not for faith night, but to attend Financial Peace University, which was in the other building. 
see where this is going because I've got a story in my hand. She shows up and she says, we're here for FPU. And we said, hey, this is Faith Night, FPU's over there. And she's like, okay, but I feel like I might need to be here. And I feel like God might be calling me to get dunked. And so she stayed here and her husband went over and did FPU and she did Faith Night and today she's getting dunked. Isn't that incredible? Thank you, Jesus. She says, I've always believed in Christ, but I never learned many of the stories of the Bible, and I did my first Bible study last fall at Prairie Heights, and I love coming. This is home. This is home. Ah, I can't wait to celebrate the decision that you guys have made. So when we choose to stand for transformed community, we see their lives change. When we choose to stand for future generations, we will support kids, teens, students, and young adults to know their identity in Christ, to gain a sense of belonging, and to guide them in pursuing their purpose. So I've got some stories of some young boys and girls. I think of that young boy in the story who offered whatever he had. These stories reflect that young boy. We've got Preston, and and when asked who is Jesus, he said, he put himself on the cross, he is Lord. We asked him uh, when he said yes to Christ, and he said, the people at KidVenture help me by being encouraging. You're going to hear KidVenture a lot, and I just want to say thank you to every one of our volunteers who loves on our kids every single week because their faith is on fire. I'm telling you, these kids, without hesitation, like that young boy, are offering everything they have. They're saying yes to Christ, and they're getting baptized. Why do you want to get baptized? To feel closer to God. Brooklyn says, I've always had church in my life, and this is just my first public commitment. She's a teenager. She said, at Oxygen, I said yes to Christ. Oxygen is our middle and high school ministry. She said, my family was instrumental in helping me say yes. They helped me by helping me know more about him and taking me to church, taking me to oxygen. So parents, never underestimate the power of influence that you have with your kids. She says, it changed me. I choose to follow him because I believe that Jesus died to make us better people. Uh, Kirsten, she's been at Prairie Heights practically her whole life. She's a teenager, and she says, I've been going to church basically since I can remember Prairie Heights specifically for the last 11 years, and I've always went to KidVenture. She said, I remember saying uh, yes during KidVenture, and I was learning about the Bible, and I was given a Bible. She says she kind of went off and on with her faith, and then she said her mom has had a huge impact on me and my faith journey, and I don't know where I would be without her. I'm sort of a control freak in many ways. You're not alone. Any control freaks in the house? Watching online, any control freaks? Isn't it funny? There's something about adults that we just don't admit it, but everybody knows it. Thanks for admitting it. Thanks for giving us freedom to admit it. Thanks for helping us realize why we need Jesus. Kirsten, you're leading the way, my friend. She says, but God, God lifts the weight off my shoulders and lets me put him in control of my life. That can happen for you too. Way to go, Kirsten. And then the ripple effect of this is Kirsten has been a part of Josie's life. And Josie, she's eight years old, and she says, uh, who's Jesus? He died for us so that our sins are forgiven. Why do we need him? We need Jesus so that we can live forever in heaven. Just recently, uh, her grandpa passed away. And she says, "When, when my papa died, I was sad. And I asked Jesus to help me be happy here and to take care of my papa in heaven, and I know he is because he loves everybody. So we got a family here who's living deep loss and grief, and today they get to also experience great joy through a young girl whose faith is strong in the midst of grief. And I know that they're not alone. I know that some of you are grieving so hard right now, and and through Josie's story and her faith, I want you to see that there can be joy in grief. She says, I want to get baptized because I want people to know that I love God. I want other kids to see that I love God so I can teach them about him and so they can get baptized too. 
hey, this is our future generation. I think they've got it handled. And I seriously think we need to stop looking down on them. We need to stop judging them. We need to stop telling them that they don't know anything. And we need to flip the script and we need to start following them. Because just like the young boy in the story, it's so much easier for them to offer what they have. And it's time, friends, to begin to pour in and to invest in the future generations and to allow them to grow up to be leaders in the faith. And they're ready. And they're ready. And I want you to know that your church family believes in you. We love you. And we know that God has something special for you. So don't ever forget this day or this moment. I love that we are going to be a church that is radical about investing in kids. Radical about investing in kids. Today we have someone in the audience who has been part of our staff way back, who is part of starting Kid Venture. And because of his influence, we have these kids today, years later, that have found Jesus. And so I want everyone to know that the impact of your life, the seeds that you plant in every season of your life, you may not always see the result, but some days you will. And to remember that you get to be a part of other people's faith journey. Dustin, my friend, thank you. Thank you for your investment. When we choose to stand for changed lives, we will close the gap of the 100,000 people who are living apart from God. And when we do that, we get to hear stories like this. Faith. Faith says, God and church played a significant role in my family. The last five years, I've been kind of lost. I had a lot of temptation that led me off the path. I said yes to Christ when I came to Prairie Heights. My parents played a huge role in all of this. They have shown me how Christ works in Work, school, friendship, family, pretty much everything. She says, now I've joined a grow group. I've changed my life from being chaotic and tempted almost everywhere I went into a calming and easy life that I enjoy waking up every day and get to live my life through Jesus. Way to go, Faith. Caitlin says, I don't think I had a life without Christ being in it, but he's taken different seats based on my priorities over time. What seat is Jesus in for you today? I want you to learn from Caitlin's story today. She said, I was 12 years old when I said yes to Christ and my grandpa had passed away. He was the patriarch of my family. Things would never be the same and I knew right then and there I wanted to see him again. And so she said yes and devoted her life to Jesus. I always told myself when I was more mature and proved and could prove that I was saved, I would get baptized Here I am 15 years later, not having proved what I thought I needed to, but coming to realize that's the entire point, accepting I don't have anything to prove. I've strayed, prioritized other things, even doubted him, but there isn't a future I could plan for myself that he won't already be there, having filled the spaces of self-doubt, heartbreak, and worry with confidence, joy, and peace in all my tomorrows. So good. And then we've got Jocelyn, and before we get to her story, real quick, I want to share There was a family, a young family, who started off uh, their life and career life, and they've just committed to be generous. And they reached out to us, this was over a year ago, and they said, hey, is there a specific need that you guys have we would love to give to a specific need, and we want to be generous. And here's what they did, is they gave so we could hire childcare workers in KidVenture during a season where we had a gap because we care so much about our kids having loving adults in their life. We hired a child care worker over a year and a half ago to be in Kid Venture to take care of kids. About halfway through that year, Jocelyn said, this child care worker, that she wanted to be a part of Prairie Heights and start attending service. And so she started attending service, and today she is getting dunked. Because somebody was generous and offered an opportunity to somebody, and because this somebody was around a lot of people who love Jesus, 
that influence rubbed off. And today she's getting dunked. She said, church played a small role in my life. I would say the most instrumental people in my saying yes to Christ is my mom and the people I've met at Prairie Heights. My new family at Prairie Heights has shown me that church is more than just reading Bible verses and singing hymns. From the first time I walked through the doors, I felt a sense of belonging. I felt like I had finally found home. And I felt so much love and acceptance here. I now know that Jesus led me here. He gave me something that I don't know, I didn't know I was missing until I found it. She says, since I said yes to Christ, and then she wrote 20 minutes ago, because this happened last week. <laughs> she says, sorry, I missed faith night. She was working, taking care of the kids. And before she left, she said, I think I have to get baptized. There were times in my life where I didn't want to be here anymore. And I would get a flash of good moments and thoughts. And now I trust Jesus to guide me through life and its troubles. Are you kidding me? <laughs> we get to be a part of this. This is so special. And so are you ready? Like, let's stand. Don't stand. Stand. <laughs> For change lives, let's stand for the people of our community, okay? Let's be in this together, and let's celebrate, and in just a few moments, we're going to experience people of all ages and backgrounds going public with their faith. And maybe many of you, me too, wonder why we do it the way we do it. Well, in Romans 10, 9, it says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so we believe that the very first step in a relationship with Jesus is to put your faith and trust in him. To believe that he died on a cross to save you from your sin, to turn from the sin in your life and commit to living with him the rest of your life here on earth. And to make an impact with him leading your life. And so if that's the prayer of your heart today, you can quietly say that in your heart and you can receive Jesus as your savior we would love to know if you made that decision, and hey, it's not too late. If you want to get dunked today, you can still get dunked today. If you feel the stirring and you made a commitment to put your faith and trust in Jesus first, you can go public with that decision today. Right now, you can go right out to the lobby right now in this moment, and they'll be ready for you to get a change of clothes and a towel. So if that's you, head out to the lobby, and they will meet you and greet you. And hey, friends who are about to get in the pool and get dunked, Here's what I want you to know, there's nothing special about this water, but there's something real special about you, and there's something real special about Jesus, and Jesus wants to be the leader of your life, not just today, but every single day from this moment forward, so I pray whatever's gone on in your life before this moment is washed away when you go under the water, when you come up out of the water, you get a new life with Jesus, and we all get to celebrate that, so I'm going to hand it over to my friend Alex. And he is going to let you know what our role is in all of this. And so, um, this is my favorite part, Alex. Don't mess it up. You got this too, Beth. <laughs> Beth is going to go get ready. She's going to get in the pool and start baptizing people. And while she's doing that, let's talk about what our roles are here in the room. The band, we're just going to be up here playing some music. You can feel free to sing along or join in, clap, but the number one, the number one thing that you have to remember is that today is a celebration. Each one of these people who are getting baptized represents a life changed by Jesus, and there is nothing more important than that, and so I want to hear the loudest cheers you've ever done, the loudest clapping you've ever done. Every time that somebody comes out of the water, it's like the Vikings won the Super Bowl, but it's something that you're actually going to witness for once. <laughs> so just like Beth said, a few moments ago, uh, if you feel God tapping you on the shoulder right now, right now, if you feel God saying, today's the day, then get up out of your chair, go out to the lobby. There's people there who've got shorts, they've got a t-shirt. Today's your day. They'll point you in the right direction. So uh, as Beth and the team get ready, let's celebrate together. Here we go.
There's a name that levels mountains and Carves out highways through the seas I've seen its power unravel bands Right in front of me There's a faith that stands defiant Sends Goliath to his knees I've seen his praise unravel shackles Right off my feet And that's the power of your name Just a mention makes a way Giants fall and strongholds break
I love these people. I love Jesus. And I love why we do this. I love why we get together and gather every single week. I love that we get to do it together. I love that church is people. And that today we were reminded that every person matters and every story matters. And today we were reminded that when you and I choose the character trait of generosity, like to be generous, Jesus is going to multiply it. And today Jesus multiplied it. And so I just want to say thank you. I want to say a huge thank you to all of you who have invested, who have given financially. I want you to know that all giving goes to stand, to stand for the people of our community, to stand for stories like we heard today. And so today, if you want to give, I want to invite you to do that. And I want you to know unapologetically that I believe there's no greater investment, there's no greater cause that you can give your money to 
than the local church. And I just want you to know, if you have a different local church, go give to that church. I'm not talking about just giving to Prairie Heights. I'm talking about giving to the house of the Lord and being faithful in your finances and being generous is a choice. And so I don't want you to make an emotional decision. That's not what I'm inviting you to. I'm inviting you to pray, to consider, and to give. And so I know a lot of you, you're newer to stand. Yeah, you have not come uh, during our, our launch of stand. And so I just want to invite you today, if you want a t-shirt, <laughs> you want some fun stand stickers, you can get that at Next Steps today. And if you have someone in your life, the most important part of stand is people who are living apart from God. If you have someone in your life who you know is living apart from God and you want to pray for that person, you can go ahead and, and you can put their name on a little card and you can put it on the map that's in the lobby of Cass and Clay County, of all the people that we are praying to come to know Jesus so we can celebrate more changed lives and give God all the credit. He gets all the credit for today. I love you all so much. Have a wonderful Sunday, and we'll see you next week.